So, welcome to tonight's segment of the Adam State University Faculty Lecture Series. For those of you who don't know who I am, or don't know who I am, I'm Jessica Lee. I'm a professor and director here, and I coordinate uh, these lectures. Uh, so, in the interest of time, I'm not going to give this full uh, introduction, I'll let Dr. Ellison um, talk through a lot of this. But even though that these, these lectures are um, sort of separated, they can stand alone, but they do uh, come together. So uh, tonight's um, lecture is uh, being presented by Dr. Allison of Psychology. Um, a, he'll give another uh, lecture next week, February 15th, same time, same place here. Uh, tonight's uh, lecture, um, is um, titled, I don't know, Squat? I wanted to say shit. There's five, there's five characters there. I'm very respectful. Um, and so Dr. Ellison received his PhD from the University of Northern Colorado in educational psychology. He also had a postdoctoral fellowship uh, from the University of Denver. He's the author of Compass of Shame Scale, which has been translated to 18 languages and used in hundreds of studies. The instrument is used to assess people's uh, preferences among five emotion regulation strategies. These strategies are linked to self-esteem, depression, violence, self-harm, and many other outcomes. So help me in welcoming Dr. Ellis. And I'm not going to talk about any of that tonight, but thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you find this half as interesting as I do, then it'll be a fun night. And uh, I will warn you, I trimmed this down from like 17 hours, um, slight exaggeration. But I, I actually developed this for a 400 level class and then trimmed it way down. So um, I really struggled and there's probably close to 60 minutes in here. So uh, religion comes last, uh, politics second last. We can always cut it short. Um, I'm willing to stay late to have a discussion, answer questions, but uh, if you need to leave, I understand. Um, I uh, won't take uh, offense to that. I do want to put in a plug. I wore my Making Sense t-shirt tonight, see if we can make sense of this stuff. And also, it's my second favorite podcast, I think, um, maybe behind Mindscape. So, metaphors are far more common than any of us realize in our language. And I'm going to describe tonight how they shape our understanding uh, and beyond just understanding uh, of lots of things from very simple sentences to very complex topics like some science. Okay. So my goal is to understand adult thinking and knowledge. And my major argument tonight is that to do that, you can't really get a handle on what it's like to think like an adult or our college grad here without considering evolution and the way it shaped our brains and development. <clears throat> so tonight I'm going to talk about the devel development part, and next week I'll talk about evolution. Like you said, same bat time, same bat station. So this is uh, sometimes called an evo-devo perspective, which is really caught on in biology and getting increasing uh, attention in psychology. It kind of fits under the rubric of embodied cognition, that our bodies are important to our thinking process. So going to look at a couple issues here, like what is knowledge? How can we know things? How should we obtain knowledge? And what are the limits of knowledge? And there are two major uh, approaches to this uh, in philosophy. One is rationalism, and sort of the opposite is empiricism. We often think of rationalism as coming from the top, pre-existing ideas and deduction, empiricism bottom up. So I arrange them that way. Uh, so some of the issues, just as an example, do we, are we born preloaded with concepts and knowledge and understanding of certain things? And if you say yes to that, uh, that's more on the nativism, uh, we would call that nativism, and that's more on the side of rationalism, like Plato. Uh, if you say no, that's more like blank slate, uh, blank slate empiricism, like John Locke. Um, where, how should we uh, get our knowledge? If you say it's from reason and logic, again, top down, uh, then that goes along with rationalism. The empiricist says it should be facts and observation, facts and only the facts. And then uh, inference, what kind of inference uh, or logic do we use? Deduction, so we start from particulars, or generalities and work to particulars. Uh, so uh, we have a theory, 
And we say, according to this theory, um, all humans are mortal. Socrates is a human. Socrates is mortal. Yay. Um, induction sort of drives, uh, well, that's uh, empiricism is based on induction going from specifics. I see one cat with fur, two cats with fur. After 100 cats with fur, I decide all cats have fur. And I'm wrong. But then um, there are a lot more issues here. And these are sort of the extremes. Uh, but this all falls under the philosophical category uh, or domain of epistemology. So that is the theory of knowledge, and you know, it's basically the stuff I talked about. What methods should we use? What is valid knowledge? Uh, things like that. And what distinguishes justified true belief from mere opinion? So we know reality, getting into the metaphors now, and uh, I've got no end reality and scare quotes and purpose there, through models and metaphors. So unless you're an astronaut, you have not seen the Earth from space. We've seen pictures of it, but you've not been up there. But, you know, we have globes, we have maps, we have other models that we use. The globe is not the Earth. The globe is a model. It's a simplification. And metaphors work uh, the same way. If we want to know about the internal workings of the human body, how many of us had one of those little plastic skeleton bodies when you were a kid and you could pull the guts out and put them back in? Not enough of you. Okay. But, right, it's a model. It's a model. You can manipulate it, but it's not the real thing. You know, hopefully you're not pulling the guts out of real people. Um, and some of our models uh, stand the test of time and some don't. Uh, but all models simplify the world for us uh, to make it easier to understand. So Bohr's solar system, Adam, in 1913, most of us learned that in school. And that's exactly right, isn't it, Marty? Uh, no. Okay, thank you. <laughs> right answer. <laughs> Whew, I was worried. I got too many fact checkers here. All right. So, you know, sometimes they oversimplify or they're just plain wrong, uh, but they often help us understand. So what metaphors do we use for human thought and knowledge? So, you know, we're using the brain. What metaphor do we use to understand thinking? I was going to say the brain, but I don't want to say that. Uh, and as with the Bohr model, sometimes they inform us and sometimes they mislead us. So this talk is not about reality. I'm not going to tell you what it is. The talk is about the reality of human thought and knowledge, at least I hope so. So it's kind of recursive. Um, and in the end, I'm going to kind of conclude that there are reasons why we don't know reality. We never actually know reality. So we can look at the metaphors of mind that fill in that gap. <coughs> One of them is math. So Pythagoras you know, came along 500-ish BC, developed geometry and some other aspects of math. And then Plato, the philosopher, comes along. And he's overly influenced by math, according to Bertrand Russell, and I would agree. So he realized that human senses were flawed. Um, perception can be wrong. You know, we can misperceive things. You and I might look at the same thing and disagree. I might be faked out by an optical illusion, uh, things like that. If you're familiar with the allegory of the cave, that fits right in. Um, so that he was influenced by the perfection of math and came up with this idea of the world of forms that out there floating in the ether somewhere were these perfect forms, the perfect circle, the perfect triangle, the perfect chair, uh, etc. And we come to know these, we can get perfect knowledge through reason um, uh, by becoming aware of these perfect forms or we're born with that knowledge, right? How can I recognize you, unless I've seen you before, right? So how can I recognize a chair unless I've seen a chair before? They must be preloaded. That's some of the logic there. Um, and the other part of this is that in the ether and in my mind, I can have the perfect circle, but no circle that I can draw here on earth and no piece of fruit is perfectly circular, right? Perfection only exists in the mind. So, um, we humans invented math, and then we mistakenly use it as a model for the mind, something that we do over and over again. So it misleads us in some ways to this idea of perfect knowledge, that reason is superior to body and emotion. Um, uh, another metaphor, the, the chariot metaphor, if you're familiar with that, the uh, crib notes here are that reason is better than desire, desire is better than emotion, emotion is inferior and leads us away from true knowledge. So the epistemology here is rationalism, right? Rationality, logic, top down. And then we have somebody like Descartes, and I'm skipping thousands of people. Uh, the idea, again, that you know, there's flaws in our perceptions. So Descartes was supposed to be the ultimate skeptic and didn't said, I'm going to throw away everything. And what did he come up with? To bail him out? I think, therefore, I am. That's the one thing I'm certain of. 
And then he immediately jumps to God, and I'm certain that God exists, so therefore we can bail us out. Our, our perceptions may be incorrect, but uh, God wouldn't be cruel and trick us too badly. We can use our reason uh, to get to that perfect knowledge. Um, so, you know, the metaphor of God being omniscient, knowing everything, uh, you wouldn't have seen that in polytheistic um, cultures so much, but as a lot of the world moved to monotheism, Judaism and Christianity and Islam, we you know, embrace the idea of monotheism and one all-powerful God that knows everything. Um, and you can see in the writings of Descartes, uh, both references to math and uh, <coughs> to God. So you know, we invented gods uh, and then mistakenly used them as a model for mind, just like we did for math. And now I'm not saying, I'm not slagging on religion and I'm not saying that your God's not real if you have a God or, or whatever. I'm just saying that we know lots of things in the world that are real through metaphor, and sometimes those metaphors are helpful, and sometimes they're not, and usually they're both. Um, but, you know, this is helpful, but also sometimes misleading. We have other religious metaphors like impurity. So, you know, the purity of thoughts and soul and reason, as opposed to the impure body and emotion leading us astray uh, to do impure things. Again, the epistemology is rationalism, top-down, prioritizing reason. And then we jump ahead a few hundred years uh, or more, and we get the metaphor of the mind is computers. This is currently the standard in cognitive psychology. So again, how do we know things? Well, w you know, look what a computer does. It, it's fast, it's efficient, it, it does perfect calculations. We can model uh, humans with artificial intelligence, human thinking. So we invent in computers, and once again, we mistakenly use that as a model for the mind. I mean, you know, we were trying to create a machine to do what our minds do, and then we go, look at this machine. My mind is just like it. That's a little bit interesting. So it misleads us to thinking of our reason as being disembodied, thought as being disembodied. If a computer can do it, why do I need a body? Why do I need emotion? And again, logic comes, um, uh, comes out looking better than emotion. So the metaphors of information processing, right? We have input, we have output, we do symbol manipulation, uh, words and characters, mathematical symbols, um, and it's all done without emotion. So again, the epistemology is rationalism. And then we can go the other direction and uh, embrace the metaphor of the blank slate. So we've got a chalkboard here. We are born like the whiteboard with no knowledge, nothing pre-existing, not preloaded, opposite of nativism. And everything that happens to us, all the knowledge that we obtain comes through the senses. We're just a blank slate uh, ready to be written on. So no pre-existing knowledge, uh, in some ways denigrating theory. Uh, everything should be fact-driven. Uh, so the epistemology here is empiricism. And I've said that all of these mislead us in some way. So they're all wrong and we're done. Lecture's over. <laughs> oh, wait, no, there's more, I forgot. Um, so another metaphor is the embodied cognition or the embodied mind. And the idea here is that evolution shaped our bodies and brains, which I already presented as my major thesis. And just as it shaped our bodies to be functional, you know, we've got opposable thumbs so we can hold a beer bottle, um, we have uh, functional ways of thinking. You know, memory's functional. Uh, but emotion is functional as well. So we can't dismiss the body, we can't dismiss emotion. And, I mean, let's be honest, newborns are pretty dumb. They're cute and, you know, they do come with some preloaded information, but they've got a long way to go. They can't even control their emotions and, you know, they don't understand what we're saying to them. They don't stop crying when I tell them to. Uh, I'm grandfather of two twin grandsons, so, uh, yep. Uh, so there's this bootstrapping process, and, that, and that's a word from computer science again, even though I just denigrated uh, the computer model. How do we bootstrap? How do we learn anything? Kind of that issue that Plato uh, struggled with. How can I recognize something if it isn't already in my mind? So uh, senses the, some of the ideas here are that senses and movement lead to metaphorical thought and uh, approximate knowledge. Okay, so um, the epistemology uh, as Lakoff, George Lakoff, labels it as embodied realism. Antonio Damasio talks about the somatic marker hypothesis, that I can think about something, and if I don't have emotion, it doesn't matter. If I have emotion, it tells me thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, in a way. So I'm gonna turn to metaphors and, and pursue this idea of embodied cognition. 
And a lot of times we take things for granted. You don't think about the tires in your car until they're flat. So let's look at some uh, broken metaphors. And obviously broken is a metaphorical term here. Um, so I'll be able to retire any day now. The stock market is really right. I can't wait for the wedding. I'm so out of love. He's such a loving, cold person. My conclusions are based off a solid theory. Now, all of those violate a metaphor. It's not just conventions of speech. And by the time we're done, we'll have gotten through all of those. So my plan isn't really this. I just want to show off a metaphor. So guess the metaphor if you want. This is a fun game we played on a climbing trip. I plan to build a cohesive argument brick by brick from the ground floor on a solid foundation using logic as the mortar that binds the supporting facts together. What is my metaphor? An argument is a building, right? Our arguments, we construct them. They have a foundation. They have layers to them. We can tear them down, things like that. So this is a strong argument, and strong is metaphorical. And everything there except for A is metaphorical. It's based on a solid foundation. A weak argument is based off a shaky foundation. So when I see that in writing, I just say, I'm sorry. Um, does anybody not follow the metaphor there? Is the metaphor clear enough? Right? It's not literal, right? OK. Um, so here's my real plan. I'm going to talk about metaphors. They're ubiquitous, meaning they're all around us. We use them all the time. They're non-trivial. They have meaning. They're not just synonyms. They're important because they have structure, and through the structure, they convey information implicitly. Okay, if I say, uh, you know, solid foundation, I'm implicitly saying that I've got a solid theory or base of facts. They're grounded in sensory motor experience. This is the embodied cognition part uh, that starts in infancy. So I've got cute baby pictures coming up, if you think babies are cute. And next week, I'll tell you babies aren't cute, but that's next week. And they're often not arbitrary, okay? They're, we don't just come pull these out of thin air, metaphorically, um, and often based on our evolutionary history. So I'll also talk about the implications of metaphors, like I promised, language, knowledge, understanding, uh, philosophy, science and math briefly, and politics and religion if we have time. So that's why this is a solid hour. So what is knowledge? Well, we have beliefs, but some of them are false, so let's not call that knowledge. We have true ones that are unjustified. You know, broken clock is right twice a day. Let's not call that knowledge. So justified true belief is kind of the standard. Um, but that's not good enough. You could improperly justify your knowledge, so it should be properly, and I put that in quotes because this is a... Uh, this is uh, an endless layer upon layer upon layer. And as far as I know, philosophers have not figured out what this means yet. You know, there's no true uh, definition. So play along with me here for a second. What's a good day or good performance on the stock market? What would you say? What happened to stocks today if it was a good day? Which I don't think it was. Think about yesterday. They're up? OK, thank you, boss. What else might you say? A really good day. What's that? Roaring. Roaring? That's the wrong metaphor. Pretend you didn't say that. Anybody else? <laughs> Bullish. Bullish? Okay. Anything else? They soared. They went through the roof. They jumped. They climbed. But did they? Did they literally, right? You know, do we need to fix the roof after stocks went through the roof? I don't think so, right? This is all metaphorical. Um, so why? Why do we use this metaphorical met metaphor of up uh, being a good day or up being more? Well, because we're an land animals which evolved uh, in an environment with gravity. Because of that, our experience is more is up. If I have more candy, it piles up. If I have more firewood, it piles up. If I have more ducats, they pile up, right? In gravity, there's no, in, uh, with no gravity, there's no up, right? I know you're just a chemist, not a physicist, but you know, there's no up in space, right? Okay, so my goal, and again, I'm just messing with you here, is I hope to eliminate, so guess uh, the metaphor, I hope to illuminate some dense material today by being transparent, but things may not be as clear as they appear. I'll try not to muddy the waters so that in the end you will see my meaning clearly. 
And I think that's the end of the metaphor. I've trimmed it so many times, this was like three times as long because it's really, really hard to think about teaching, learning, understanding without this metaphor. What's my metaphor? Knowing is seeing, okay? So to understand something is to see. See what I mean? Let me illuminate this for you. Oh, it's really transparent, you know, clear facts, right? So knowing is seeing, and if I fail or I struggle to understand, I'm not seeing what you mean, because maybe the material's dense, or I'm dense, maybe the waters are muddy, uh, or it's obscure. So there was this uh, fellow named Jean Piaget, uh, the most famous cognitive developmentalist uh, ever, who came up with this stage theory of how we go from you know, dumb little babies to hopefully smart uh, college grads. And we've got four stages here. Um, the operational thing, means a logical operation. And it can be very simple. It can be a comparison. Which is bigger? Which do you like more? But it can be formal logic. It can be math, operations. But in this first stage, the first stage of the first two years of life is sensory motor. It's all about getting the brain wired up to understand sensations, right? Uh, a baby doesn't recognize objects in its environment. You know, doesn't distinguish the, the cat from the dog from the door. Um, and motor control. Little babies are all over the place, right? You know, they try to suck their thumb and they poke themselves in the eyes and they chew on the back of their hand. They're super uncoordinated, so they're wiring up uh, through experience. Um, stage two is a lot about language. It's language learning, it's ambiguous, but it's very concrete uh, very often. You know, that's the dog, right? Uh, as opposed to um, that's fairness or equity. I, I don't hear two-year-olds talk about equity too much. Well, maybe until their twin brother grabs a hold of something. Oh, good. So here's a classic Piagetian task. Can you look at these two boxes? Do you think that they have the same amount of juice? Do you think they have the same? Okay. Now we're going to pour this juice into this box. Now, do you think that this glass has more juice? This glass has more juice, or do you think that they have the same amount? That one has more. This one has more, and why do you think that this one has more? Because it's taller. Stupid, stupid kid. <laughs> All right. I love kids. Joking, joking. All right. Dry sense of humor. <clears throat> and then we move on to logic that's dependent on concrete facts, things that we can see and manipulate. So, you know, when you're learning math, uh, some people had the little bars that were of different lengths, and you can push them together, and that's all from uh, Piaget. Um, that we learn through experience with concrete things. Um, our logic is fairly concrete. Uh, our concepts are increasingly abstract. And then uh, 12 years and up, we get better and better with more abstract logic and much more abstract concepts. And you might think the metaphor applies to very simple things, you know, describing whatever. Um, love is like a rose. I guess love is pretty abstract. Um, but the more abstract things get, the more we rely on metaphor. So um, this knowing uh, is seen metaphor that I mentioned, this uh, is a famous experiment that has nothing to do with knowing is seen, but the little kid's really cute and demonstrates it. So I'm going to try to find it. So in this study, they're trying to show how smart one-year-olds are, how much back and forth there is between a baby and uh, an adult or a caregiver. And then what the mom does is they go, still face and don't move and the kid freaks out and it shows that that kid has expectations that kid has a lot of knowledge uh, going on but that's not uh what i'm here to show you watch the kid right now he gives a greeting to the baby the kid's distracted this baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage him and play with him. so the baby knows something that the mom doesn't and says look because knowing is seen. If you see it, then you'll know what I know. This pre-verbal infant understands that relationship, right? And we use this metaphor as adults and professors, and adults and professors, sort of similar. Um, and I, I won't show it, but it's amazing. When the mom goes still face, the kid you know, tries to get her attention and smiles and yells, and then the kid points to the corner and doesn't look, looks at mom. This pre-verbal one-year-old baby does an experiment on mom, is testing mother, right? I mean, naturally we say, look, and she goes, look, mom, what's wrong with you? Please act normal. 
So, like I said, knowing is seen. A lot of this stuff comes from these two books by uh, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson. Metaphors We Live By came out in 1980. Uh, very fun read, uh, I guess, if you're a geek, if you find this interesting. And then they realized what they'd latched onto and developed it uh, to a huge degree in philosophy in the flesh, where they looked at this idea of the embodied mind and how everybody uses metaphors. Philosophers have used metaphors, like I showed you earlier on. So back to uh, the real plan. I'm not going to spend much time on the ubiquity part of it, because I've already shown you a lot of metaphors, and there are a lot more to come. But we haven't scratched the surface. This is just the tip of the iceberg, yada, yada. Metaphors all over the place. But they're non-trivial, they convey meaning. Um, you know, we might think that it's all about poetry or creative writing, love is like a rose. But they're not just flowery embellishments, get the metaphor. Um, we cancel people who aren't woke and deplatform them for dog whistles. Yeah, but metaphors aren't just slang either. Uh, metaphors are like beef, they're what's for dinner. Major things like time, causality, space, self, free will are understood metaphorically. And I think I'll have time to get to most of those. Um, they're important and helpful in conveying meaning and understanding. So let me illustrate this. This is not a confession. This is just an example. Nine words containing five metaphors. I fought my way out of a deep depression. So you've got to play along with me here. Was I feeling happy? Of course not, right? Because metaphorically, sad is down. I'm down in the dumps. I'm feeling low. So depression, oh, that's way too dark. That's a person in a hole. Uh, depression is way down, so far down, you're below the surface of the earth. You're in a depression, you're in a hole, right? Metaphorically, not literally. Was I a little sad or a lot sad? A lot, thank you. Yeah, it's severe because I said depression, it's not just sadness, it's not just feeling low. And I uh, uh, magnified that by saying deep, right? Deep depression. Was it easy to feel better? No, no absolutely not. It was difficult. A fight is difficult, right? I had to fight my way out. If I'm in a deep hole, climbing out is difficult. Did it take time and effort? Yeah, a fight takes time and effort. Climbing out of a deep hole takes time and effort. Was I then in a different state? Yeah, right? I escaped from depression. So metaphorically, emotions are states, and states are containers, so I can be in or out. I can be in depression, Really? Is it like a bucket? Where am I? And then I can be out of depression. I can be, well, other things like that that we'll get to in a minute. Um, in addition, change is movement along a path, right? Are you making progress in changing your life? Are you making progress toward retirement? You know, you've got an initial state, you've got a goal state, and you've got a path that you're traversing. So all of that is in five uh, metaphors in nine words, sadness, severity, difficulty, energy, etc. I conveyed a lot of stuff that I never said, you know, so implicitly, I didn't have to say it explicitly, you're reading between the lines. So how does this work? Well, structure. Knowledge can exist without memory, even in a computer. Memory is encoded in neurons, so memory is structured metaphorically in schema, scripts, and frames are the words we use in psychology. And all those are metaphorical terms for another metaphor, basically a blueprint. So you have a schema for a dog, and a schema for a cat, and a schema for mom, and a schema for love, and a schema for college, and, and all those things. So ideas are related when neurons network, which they do. So hearing hot also activates the neurons for cold through something called spreading activation. It's kind of like throwing a pebble in the water and the ripple goes out. So, um, uh, so they activate other elements that are in the structure, like the building metaphor, <clears throat> including expectations that we might have. So let me demonstrate my comedic abilities here. What do jokes do? They often activate a schema and then violate it. So when Rodney Dangerfield says, take my wife, so take is metaphorical, but the whole thing, take my wife, means take my wife, for example, is what's activated in our brains. And then Rodney says, please, and it viol violates the expectation, right? Take my wife, please, you know, get her out of here. Don't leave, honey. Just kidding. Um, but this is a very common form uh, of comedy, and some people are just masters at it. I mean, a couple of the recent, uh, I won't go into it. I don't have time. So let's go back to this idea of an argument as a building. Theory or set of facts could be the foundation. 
So there's a mapping, like we say in math, y equals mx plus b. There's a mapping from the literal uh, to the metaphorical. Facts could be the bricks. We build our argument out of facts, brick by brick. Premises and facts, or I could work this way as well, could be the supports that hold up the argument. They scaffold it, buttress it, shore it up. These are all metaphorical terms that make sense when I'm talking about an argument, right? You know, I want to I want to buttress my argument with more data. We talk about the coherency of an argument. Does it hold together? Is it cohesive? Cohese, right? Is it glued together? Does it hang together? The logic, and again, you could substitute some of these, but that could be the mortar, the structure, the form. Does my argument have a form? Is it a physical thing? No, but it certainly has a form. In fact, we talk about formal logic. That doesn't mean you put on a suit and tie to do your logic. It means the form of the logic, you know? Uh, all B or C, A is a B, therefore A is a C, is a formal argument. When we talk about validity or truth, a good argument or a bad argument, we talk about them being strong, solid, I destroyed your argument, it crumbled, right? These are not literal terms, these are all metaphorical that are conveying a good bit of meaning. And again, they've, because it is a large metaphorical structure, I can say parts of it and imply other things that help you understand. Does that make sense? I hope. So, grounded in sensory motor experience and in infancy. So, love is metaphorically warm and soft because of physical comfort as babies, right? We talk about a warm person, a soft-hearted person, and getting the cold shoulder. Really? Do I, do I feel like your shoulder was cold when you snubbed me? No, I don't think so. And that comes from the lived experience in infancy, right? Being held, you feel softness and warmth, and that's what lots of animals uh, uh, prefer, okay? So what, as I go through this, I forgot to mention that I'm putting in bold the uh, metaphorical terms. And for this next section, I'm putting the metaphors first and then the literal experience upon which they're based, right? These are the literal experiences of the baby. How does this work? I'm not gonna go too much into it, but your body has a whole bunch of different cortices. So, uh, you know, you've got touch and pressure and you've got motor control. So those are super important, that sensory motor stage. Other sensory cortices like the visual cortex back here, uh, language or semantics and meaning um, and hearing. And you've got these different areas and they're all interconnected to some degree. So, you know, when you see lightning and hear thunder and that happens over and over again, your brain associates them because it's wired to do that. If there's one thing the human brain is good at, and it's not just the human brain, even snails do associative learning, right? Classical conditioning, Pavlov's dogs are associating the bell with food, bell with food, uh, or reward. I do something and I get reinforced for it. So um, we're very good at associative learning, and this is kind of the way it works. Everything's coded in neurons. You're having these simultaneous experiences uh, that cross uh, different areas. So going back to love is warm, that baby is embraced, and all these areas in the brain are stimulated. There's warmth stimulating those sensory regions. There are attachment mechanisms from evolution. So there's an emotional reaction, there's motor regions, mom's embrace, other attachment things are, if the baby's mobile, it pursues mom when mom walks away. Uh, mom says, I love you. So there's auditory, and there's the semantic. What does love mean? What does mom mean? What does you mean? You know, so all this is happening at once. So you've got this simultaneous experience that includes warmth and love overlapping. So your brain is wired to associate the two. So these common experiences, again, it's the lived experience, it has an evolutionary basis, and ends up affecting our knowledge and our understanding uh, of the world. So getting back to that, <coughs> uh, we said more is up. Upper class, high status, subordinate, stocks crashed, yeah, the ducats pile up, and the twins know that more firewood goes up. Um, think about the uh, Piagetian task of the more. Uh, child has a sippy cup, all these areas are activated. Mom sees that it, it's getting low, says, do you want more milk? So you're seeing height, and you're seeing hearing more, auditory and semantic regions, and there's ambiguity. What does more mean, taller or quantity? 
Well, you know, I mean, when you're a stupid one-year-old, you're going to think it's tallness, right? And that's demonstrated over and, again, over and over again. Piaget talked about being faked out by appearances. So um, simultaneous, simultaneous activation of more and up, that network overlap, and all of a sudden you get adults talking about the stock market, and you get Descartes doing Cartesian coordinates where the positive is the y-axis going up, right? That's not, uh, that's not uh, arbitrary. Uh, you could draw it the other way. I deleted some slides. I had the stocks, a great day in the stock market going down to the left. And as long as I label the axes right, that works. <coughs> so, you know, we've got this overlap and the kid's confused. And, and even when the kid figures it out, we still have the metaphor and it sticks with us for the rest of our lives. Um, states, like I said, are containers. So I can be in love, I can be in poverty, I can be out of debt. Oh, look, I'm in debt, I'm out of debt. There it was, I just jumped out. What is it, is it a box, is it a bucket? You know, you can be in the end zone. That makes a little more sense, it's a bounded region, but it doesn't have walls, it doesn't hold water, yet we use it. And kids love to play with containers. So again, those are the metaphorical, and this is the literal. This is the literal experience. Maybe the kid's not drinking coffee, but you know, Brooks knows he's in the box, and Wyatt knows that his head is in the box of fat tire. Um, and if you've been around babies, they do that all the time. You give them a cup, and they're gonna say, oh, what happens if I pour this stuff out? And they throw stuff in there, and they jiggle it around, and they'll play with containers. They'll make containers out of stuff you'd never imagine. So uh, just going back quickly, I couldn't help myself. Another metaphor for the mind is the container. And I know Dr. Kirkland talks about uh, metaphors of the mind. She uses a similar article in Cognitive Psych. So, you know, here's the teacher pouring knowledge into the student. That's one lousy metaphor. So facts are objects, right? My head is uh, teaching is knowledge transfer. I'm transferring it out of the pot, out of the teacher, into the student. There's storage and retrieval, right? I can store something in a container. I can retrieve it out. That's putting memory in and pulling memory out. I can keep things in mind, right? In mind. I'm out of my mind. I've been told that many times. I'm full of ideas. My mind is empty. So the brain, you know, you're just a skull with a container for knowledge, for facts. We think deeply, right? When that container is full and we're digging deep, okay? Um, support maps to onness. Okay, so I can be on welfare. Am I standing on it? I can be on Prozac, right? Supporting my mental health. And look at this last one. I can be on life support. You have on and support, uh, both in the same phrase, right? Am I actually on life support? I'm connected to life support. So again, the literal, the cup is supported by the table. It is on the table. Wyatt knows that he's on the table being supported by it. And Brooks knows that he's on his mommy's shoulders, right? So on is being supported, and we use that metaphorically as adults all the time. So even the simplest of our sentences, we haven't gotten to science yet, or any hard stuff, uh, politics, um, but we use these metaphors constantly. Again, uh, uh, point number five, uh, they're non-arbitrary often, some might be, uh, and based on our evolutionary experience, you know, our experience of here, our environment on Earth. So warmth and love, seeing and knowing, up is more, uh, but lots of others. Um, oh yeah, I had to cut a whole bunch of stuff. But think about these concepts. Force, this is force, I'm applying a force. And that's the simple, literal experience of force. But we say I was forced to do it. My wife said she was forced to come here tonight. I did not drag her out of the house. She could have, she, she could have stayed home. Causality, we say, you know, what's the cause of violence in the Middle East? That's not a literal, this type of cause, right? The simple embodied experience. Impediments, I ran into a brick wall, right? We know what that means. I didn't actually ran into a brick wall. I haven't done that for a while. And time is distance. Why? Because we all know that if I wanna go from here to the door, that's a distance that's gonna take me some time. And time and distance, especially when you live in the valley and there's no traffic and you can drive 60 miles an hour everywhere, they're almost perfectly correlated. If they're perfectly correlated like thunder and lightning, they're gonna be connected. So check this out, this is one of my absolute favorites. I might tear up. <laughs> Good job. Uh-oh. So Brooks 
is applying a force. He is the cause of movement. He ran into an impediment, and it took him time to cover that distance. So at a year and a half, they're having these experiences, and they barely are talking in sensible language. They have twin language. <clears throat> so, you know, Jake asks Elwood, how far is LA? 30 hours. 30 hours is not a distance, right? They're interchangeable many times. And often when I ask something like, how far is it to LA? We just drove there over Christmas. I don't care about the mileage. Well, maybe I do because of the price of gas, but I really care how long is it going to take me? That's what I really should be asking. How long is it going to take me to get to LA? But I shortcut it and I say, how far is it to LA? And somebody answers with time. So this time and distance mapping is uh, super prevalent. And uh, in metaphors we live by, uh, I'm, I was getting into the chapters where we're getting into these topics, these scientific topics, and not just uh, on and in metaphors. And I, I saw, oh my gosh, there's like 12 pages on impediments. I was like, this sounds boring. It's not, check this out. So imagine a senator trying to get a rule changed. We know that's not gonna happen anytime now. Um, <clears throat> the senator could say, I ran into a brick wall, but I broke through when I gained Smith's support. Lots of metaphors. A lot of information conveyed. Contrast it to, I faced a roadblock, but I made an end run around the obstacle. What are the different implications here? A brick wall really stops you. A roadblock, sure. But when you break through a brick wall, you are stopped abruptly, you broke through, and once you're through, you're probably gonna make progress, right? And the impediment, maybe it was a rule, or you, know, you needed one more vote, you addressed the problem directly. Here you didn't, you cheated. I made an end run, right? If this was a rule, I cheated, I went around the rule, right? I, I was sneaky, or I cheated, or, or I did something. So there's a very different implication using the same basic metaphor of an impediment. Check this one out. I got bogged down in a swamp of procedures, but I slogged through. This is not an abrupt brick wall. I'm making progress, but man, it's slow and annoying bureaucracy, right? And we use these so automatically, and it conveys so, so much information, and it's so implicit that we don't really think about them. So we're all forgiven, I hope, if we don't uh, catch on to all these metaphors. Um, finally, uh, as I said before, very difficult abstract concepts in science, so force, time, space, time, uh, we know metaphorically, and I'll get to those. Depression, grit, there's going to be a talk on grit next Wednesday. What a nice metaphorical term. Attachment? Yeah, the mom and baby are like glue, right? Even self is metaphorical, or understood metaphorically at least. And again, I'm not saying that these things aren't real, I'm just saying that we often know them metaphorically. <clears throat> deep learning, deep reading, deep understanding. Again, what a metaphor that is, right? And is that a scientific explanation? No, it's a metaphorical description that makes sense to us. You know, deep, deep reading is I'm paying attention and I'm thinking about it. Shallow is I'm skimming it. Skimming, that's metaphorical. I, I, I can't even get through a sentence without my metaphors popping out. So because that 1980s book was written, uh, was metaphors we uh, live by, a lot of people have paraphrased that, metaphors we die by or kill by. So here's a journal metaphor and metaphors we die by, geoengineering metaphors and the argument from catastrophe. So what metaphors do we have for the Earth? You know, if you think the Earth is just a vehicle, let's trash it and move on to the next vehicle. If you think the Earth is, uh, you know, a living organism, we need to nurture it, right? And these things have implications for things like climate change. Are we going to address it or not? Or are we just going to be like, which one is it? Elon that just wants us to inhabit Mars or whatever. Uh, metaphors we die by. Metaphors shape our understanding, cognition. So in, in psychology, we often talk about the ABCs. A is affect or emotion. B is behavior. C is cognition. And you see all of those here. Our understanding is our cognition, our emotions, and our rituals are our behaviors around dying. So if you, with, when people have different metaphors for death and dying, they face it differently. I remember the first time when my grandmother died, I was 12 years old and I was like, wow, you know, I, I wasn't there at the time, my dad had picked me up and I was like, man, I'm gonna walk in her house and all the relatives are gonna be crying. And I walk in and my, all my relatives, it's a family reunion, you know, they're having a great time telling stories of my grandmother. I mean, yeah, we were all sad to lose her, but it was a time of fond remembrance, right? That's a different metaphor. 
uh, than some people have. Or if you think there's life after death, that's a different metaphor than if you think it's lights out. Metaphors we kill by, tragic uh, occurrence in uh, Paris, <coughs> Charlie Hebdo, is a, a satirical newspaper. It mocks everything. And they published pictures of the wrong religious characters, and 12 of them were murdered, and a bunch more people were injured. So those are some pretty heavy metaphors uh, driving that type of behavior. Um, the war in Ukraine. What metaphors are driving the war in Ukraine? Things about freedom, right? And things about the old days of the Soviet empire. You know, there, there are many, many metaphors about everything. <laughs> Politics, nationality, uh, et cetera, superiority. Uh, politics worth killing and dying for. Look at the metaphors here. You know, the galas, the noose, the modified flags. Uh, I guess that's Second Amendment. Make America great again. Skull and crossbones. You know, tons of metaphors. And, uh, you know, symbol, metaphor, pretty much the same. And on a more positive note, a mixed note, is you know, the uh, protest for women's rights in Iran right now. You know, people are willing to die. Many people have died. Many protesters have died um, over uh, what's going on there. So a lot of metaphors are driving behavior on both sides in Iran. Um, so like I said, they have real world effects, these ABCs. They implicitly convey meaning and they help with understanding, but they can also mislead. So we understand depression metaphorically, implicitly affect emotions. Um, if we go back to the argument as a building, Marty and I can disagree, and we can have the greatest argument where we both learn. We can co-construct knowledge, and it's a win-win situation, right? But if Marty and I are like, I gotta win, make you the loser, it's a win-lose situation, and we're not co-constructing knowledge, we're not building something together, we're tearing each other down through a war. The other major metaphor for an argument is a war is a battle. I took a position, I defended it, you know, I fired a volley of shots, you know, meaning arguments or, or uh, facts. And so they affect our emotions and obviously they affect our behaviors uh, from the very simple. Um, in one experiment, you're asked to see when two things happen. And when the first one happens, you press the left button and then the right button. And then other people press the right button when the first thing happens and the left button. Which one's faster? Think about the x-axis. <laughs> Time goes left to right, at least here in uh, many Western cultures. So if you do left right, it's more natural. That's the way it's coded in your brain. So people are faster left to right than they are right to left. Another experiment done by the same person, give, give somebody five pictures uh, of somebody at different ages from you know, 20 years old to 70 years old and ask us to arrange it. Almost every one of us is gonna arrange it left to right from young to old as we move into the, into the future. But in some other cultures, they don't see time going left to right, they see time going east to west because that's the way the sun goes. So ours is always relative to my body. No matter which way I'm facing, I'm gonna do it left to right. So in terms of the earth, the position's gonna change. But those people, if they're facing east, they're gonna arrange them from youngest to oldest toward their body. But if they're facing north, they're gonna do what we do, left to right. Pretty amazing, huh? Pretty cool. Um, they implicitly uh, and explicitly affect higher abstract knowledge and behavior, science and war. So um, I'm making progress here. Uh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say we checked those off and because we covered all this, I'm gonna say we're good for now on that. So let's move on to philosophy. So um, I already talked about some of this, uh, sort of the flawed answer is rationalism. The idea of innate ideas, nativism, primacy of thought and reason. So Descartes, Plato, and Kant all fit pretty well there. The idea of essences, that there's an essence to a rock, and there's an essence to a dog, and there's an essence to a human being, um, follows along with that. So as I pointed out before, <coughs> these, uh, this philosophy has been impeded by these two metaphorical systems, the perfection of mathematics and the perfection of gods. And um, in back-to-back -back paragraphs, I believe, Descartes says this exact thing. You know, can't I make a mistake adding two plus two? But my reason corrects me. Well, can't I be wrong with my perception? Yes, I can, but God's given uh, ability for logic uh, bails me out. So again, it's this top-down, disembodied, mind-first 
uh, deduction-centered experience that leads to perfect knowledge. So uh, I, I had a very long quote, but I got to cut back. There's a great difference between mind and body drives this idea of mind-body dualism that the body is the body, it's material, and the mind is something immaterial, okay? And this is one of the great questions uh, in psychology and maybe philosophy. So Western thought developed two incorrect ideas from this dualism and from Descartes. Reason is disembodied because the mind is disembodied. Again, like Plato, this free-floating forms. Reason is transcendent and universal. Again, it doesn't have to live in a brain, it's out there. <clears throat> um, some examples are claims of rationalism. If you're familiar with Chomsky and language, he's a good example of this perspective. Language is mathematical and logical. We can capture language in symbols, meaningless symbols, X's and Y's and symbolic logic can capture a language. And it's nativistic. We're born with a language acquisition device. True sentences are those that correspond to reality. So my cup is on the table, seems to correspond to reality, but I am in love. It seems rather metaphorical to me, but I am, sweetie. Um, words, categories are defined by necessary and sufficient conditions. Goes along with not just logic, and we could draw the Venn diagram, necessary and sufficient means they're exactly the same, or set theory, right? We have integers and non-integers and never the two shall meet. Well, I guess they meet uh, in the number line, but, um, they're different, right? They don't overlap, and we've got these perfect definitions of integer versus non-integer. But there are challenges to this. When we talk about the correspondence theory, which reality am I talking about? Does color exist or doesn't it? Are my shoelaces blue? I'm gonna tell you next week, they're not. A physicist would tell you they're not, okay? Objects do not inherently have color. Objects reflect light. Color only exists in brains. No brain, no color. So I've got, you know, which is true? Well, they're both true, depending on my uh, perspective. And, and again, metaphor means I'm not going to have a perfect correspondence. M so many of the things, most of what we know, don't have necessary and sufficient definitions. Set theory doesn't work well. Uh, Wittgenstein used the example of games. Give me a definition of games so I can identify every game from every non-game perfectly. Can't be done. And uh, my advisor in grad school used the example of a salad. This is your homework assignment, and I'll give you $100 if you can do it. Define a salad in words so that I can identify every salad from every non-salad. They don't all have lettuce. They're not all cold. Some of them macaroni, some of them potatoes, you know. Uh, and the idea of metaphors uh, being embodied, you know, such a warm person. All of these are uh, challenges to rationalism. And, and I know I'm kind of hitting this at a surface level. But, you know, um, I only have so much time, and I bit off more than I could chew, metaphorically. Um, concepts don't have necessary and sufficient conditions. Correspondence theory of knowledge is incomplete. So objectivism, truth with a capital T, uh, isn't very realistic as a philosophical position. Um, less flawed answer? Well, we've got empiricism. Knowledge is gained by the senses, through observation. This idea of a passive mind, that the mind isn't really doing anything, we're just pouring it in, that's kind of that uh, container metaphor of the brain, right? Um, there are no innate ideas, the tabula rasa, blank slate, and you know, here are three people who really exemplify those uh, positions. Um, Hume was the best of them from my perspective, that's very biased, I'm sure. But that blank slate metaphor is an impediment to understanding real human beings. Um, the passive mind, is our minds are not passive, um, and they lacked data. They lacked science at the time. Evolutionary theory, developmental theory. Um, personally, reading Hume, I'm unbelievably impressed, and I think that if he had come after Darwin, whew, man, gives me goosebumps. And if Darwin had only known about genes, if Mendel was alive, if Darwin had known that shit, just imagine, oh, I get goosebumps every semester when I talk about that. Okay. So bottom-up, embodied senses first induction uh, leads to the conclusion or implies that knowledge is constructed, uh, which it is, and it's provisional. It's not perfect. So some challenges to empiricism. We are not a blank slate. And Steven Pinker wrote like a 600-page book about why we're not. It's an evolutionary psych perspective. It's called the blank slate, and the entire book is we are not a blank slate, giving examples of how the mind is preloaded in some ways not with 
ideal forms, uh, necessarily like uh, Plato thought. Senses are indeed unreliable, um, and you know most of those guys, especially Hume, uh, embraced that position, which led him to a deep skepticism. And then he pulled the parachute and said, well, we still got to get shit done, so let's just move on. Um, science and theory do produce novel predictions by way of deduction. We can't, don't want to scrap deduction. I mean, science is based on empiricism and induction, but we do deduction all the time. It's, it's a cyclical process. And deduction leads to some pretty interesting things. Nobody had ever observed gravity bending light before the theory came along. So this is a prediction of a theory of something that was not observed first, right? Am I right? Whew, man, all, these, all this fact checking, I'm nervous. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> epistemological conclusions, conclusions for philosophy here. You know, again, this idea of embodied realism really strikes me. Mind is inherently embodied. Uh, this I'm going to talk about a lot more next week. Thought is mostly unconscious. Some estimates are more like 98, 99%. So if it's unconscious, what's the role of consciousness in, in top-down rationalistic thinking? Uh, abstract concepts are largely metaphorical or understood metaphorically. So rationalism, objectivism, metaphysical realism, if you take it to the extreme, can't be real. There's something to it, but it can't be uh, correct. Blank slate empiricism, complete subjectivity, pure relativism, anything means anything, uh, can't be correct either, right? Where uh, not only are metaphors and our knowledge embodied, um, but they're also non-arbitrary, right? Like up. Um, so I, I love this. Uh, Locke, John Locke, captured the idea of the blank slate by saying there's nothing in the intellect that was not previously in the senses, right? We don't come preloaded. Everything that's in here came through our senses, hearing, taste, touch, smell, and sight. And then Leibniz comes along and quotes him and throws in, except the intellect itself. Man, that would have been a mic drop moment if they'd had mics back then. I would have been like, take that. <laughs> I love that quote, okay? And, you know, I don't totally agree with Leibniz, but uh, I do agree with this idea that there is an intellect there in the idea that our thinking and our knowledge is dependent on a brain, and that brain is organized in a very specific way. You're not just randomly wired. Uh, you know, that optic nerve goes to your occipital cortex. Even if it's not working very well, you're wired up for that, and you're wired up for associative learning, you know, for classical conditioning and operant conditioning, and even simpler, more, yeah, simpler, heavy in learning than that. So I mentioned Damasio uh, earlier on. He wrote this uh, brilliant book around 97, I think it was published. Does that sound right? Um, Descartes' Error. And his point is that this emphasis on reason is unreasonable, that emotion matters. And I won't go into a lot of detail, but he looked at neurological patients who basically had no emotion. And they could do math, they could do logic, they could reason about everyday things, and then they couldn't make a freaking decision. Like, okay, I weighed this against this, and I eh, guess I just don't have an opinion. It just doesn't matter to me. I have no emotion. And has a thing called the somatic marker hypothesis. I think about something, and I have an emotional reaction, and emotion is what, when we say something matters to me, you are saying I have an emotional reaction to it, right? When uh, my cat dies, I'm in tears. But how many people died in Syria? Was it like 5,000 in the earthquake? We get news like that, and it's like, well, I don't know those people, right? And we're often very illogical about where we donate money um, and, and what we care about. So emotion is what makes things uh, matter. <clears throat> and uh, for this reason, um, he argues against the idea that AI could ever be conscious. And, and I agree with him. I, I could easily be swayed. I, I flip back and forth sometimes. I do some of the thought experiments, um, which I won't go into. Um, so, you know, I, I told you at the beginning, I don't know shit, so, or I don't know squat. Either way, I don't know either of them. I don't know squat or shit. Um, but, you know, this is kind of my read of the situation. I'm persuaded by people like Damasio uh, on that issue. Um, another conclusion, knowledge is constructed. It's not objective. Um, this goes along a little bit more with next week, but I believe morality is constructed. Um, you know, other people say, well, God gives us morality. Okay, who's God? Well, we can reason our way to perfect morality, Immanuel Kant. Yeah, right. 
Um, I, don't, I don't buy it. Meaning and purpose are constructed. I mean, if you're religious, maybe that provides your meaning for you, and that's great. You're making your meaning, and maybe you believe that it's being given to you or laid out for you, and, and that's wonderful. We all need meaning in our lives. Meaning in my life increased dramatically when my twin grandsons were born, right? I, I make my own meaning. We all have to make our own meaning, and we construct that. It's absolutely important, but we don't all have to have the same meaning, right? My grandsons are cute. Well, they're not. I'm going to explain that next week. Uh, they're not inherently cute. Um, but, uh, you know, just like my shoelaces aren't inherently blue. Um, but yeah, anyway. Uh, so metaphors in science. Massive pros. We understand a lot of things better because of well-chosen metaphors. But there are incorrect implications as well. So anybody who's taught physical science or remembers taking it in high school knows that you can use the metaphor, the analogy that electricity flowing through a wire is like water flowing through a pipe. They're exactly the same, except where they aren't. And students are misled by that. A good teacher says, this is where the analogy works, and this is where it breaks down, so don't, you know, don't make this assumption. And we all use these metaphors uh, in teaching. Uh, Newton's metaphors, distance metaphor, time is distance. Warped space-time, how can I warp time if it's not a spatial dimension? How can I warp a thing that has no length to it? The block universe comes out of general relativity, I hope, um, that the past and future and the present all exist at once. We're just working our way through a metaphorical block of time, but it's all there. So maybe somehow time travel is possible. If we don't have a block universe, then maybe it's not possible. Determinism, so lots of people interpret the metaphors and even the formulas of general relativity as being deterministic. But is that an incorrect assumption based on the metaphor, or is that the nature of the universe? And that's up for grabs. I don't think physicists have agreed on that, at least as of my reading two nights ago. Um, the many worlds, I don't know if you've heard of this, many worlds uh, of quantum physics is one interpretation. There are other interpretations. The multiverse is different than the uh, many worlds interpretation. String theory. We don't live in a three-dimensional universe or a three dimensions of space plus one dimension of time. We live in an 11-dimension universe that involves, involves these tiny vibrating strings for the other seven dimensions. We just can't perceive them. And nobody's perceived them. Nobody's devise an experiment to show that these strings exist as far as I understand, but man, the math works really good, apparently. Especially when they went to 11 dimensions, 10 wasn't enough. <clears throat> that was a model or a metaphor that people were very excited about until it seemed to hit a dead end. And then very few people were doing string theory. I think it was around 1985, somebody said, hey, check out this 11th dimension. Now we got something. And all of a sudden, hundreds of people are working on string theory. Um, if you're not familiar, quantum mechanics has not been resolved with, or resolved is probably not quite the right word, what am I looking for here, uh, with general relativity. So we don't have a complete view of physics. D do we need one? That's debatable. Um, but maybe string theory fixes that, maybe it doesn't. And maybe different mathematical metaphors work. It's a good article in The Atlantic about, are rational numbers, do they really go out to infinity? Well, sure, in theory, but is there anything, any atomistic view of matter, like subatomic particles, that goes to infinity, right? At some point, it stops. You know, we might have some rounding error, but that change is both quantum physics and general relativity moving both toward each other, but not quite meeting yet. The Big Bang, there's a metaphor for you. What does that imply? Must have been really loud, right? Wait a second, sound doesn't travel in a vacuum. And if the Big Bang is right, there was no space. Space came into existence with the Big Bang, no space, the ultimate vacuum, no sound. And besides, sound only happens in brains. There was nobody there to hear it. Is there an origin? Cartesian coordinates, you know, the origin, zero, 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 and three-dimensional Cartesian coordinates. Is there an origin to the universe? I think physicists say no, although, and Einstein definitely makes it seem like there isn't with uh, general relativity, but I guess there's some debate about that, and I don't follow it, I don't know, I just 
got a glimpse of that in my reading last week. Absolute space. <clears throat> you know, general relativity says there's no absolute space. So, um, again, our metaphors can be very helpful. They can be misleading. But we use them all the time. We rely on them. I mean, how would you think about the origins of the universe uh, without uh, metaphors? Uh, even religion. What's, I mean, what is the... The metaphor, right? You know, the mother goddess or the father goddess, both mother and father are metaphorical. And the unmoved mover, every cause, I'm sorry, every effect has a cause except that one. The start of the universe was caused, caused by, so I guess it did have a cause, but it was caused by the thing that doesn't have a cause. God is the unmoved mover. Very metaphorical. So a great metaphor that is... Uh, self-mocking maybe, is that all of these models and metaphors involve simplifying assumptions that can re uh, lead to incorrect implications, like I said. So there's a joke about physicists and spherical cows in a vacuum, right? If we want to know about balls rolling down an inclined plane, it's a frictionless surface. If we want to know, uh, you know, if the farmer can get his uh, cows to grow bigger, how much more beef is he going to have? You ask a physicist, and a physicist says, shit, the volume of a cow, I don't know that, but I know the volume of a sphere. Let's assume a spherical cow, and I can give you an answer. It's not a real answer, but, you know, it's approximate, right? So metaphors and models are never perfect. <clears throat> uh, in biology, we talk about fitness landscapes. This is supposed to represent something about... Uh, the adaptation, how well adapted a species it is to the environment that it's living in. And we're looking at a two-dimensional rendering of a three-dimensional space. But fitness landscapes have about a million dimensions, right? I mean, you could almost say one for every, uh, uh, not, well, allele location in the genome. Selection pressures? Selection pressures are like the fast fox that kills the slow rabbit. That's a selection pressure. But it's all metaphorical, right? Uh, CRISPR is the molecular scissors to edit genes. Check out those metaphors. That's some wild shit right there. Both in reality, what we're doing, or not me, uh, what real scientists are doing. Uh, but the metaphors are, are pretty wild. Uh, raise your hand if you know this one. Man, no biology geeks? Oh, man, I won't go into it. Never mind. Um, so here's a huge spherical cow from economics. Rational choice theory? It's useful, but this is not human beings, okay? This is a rationalist dream. Um, and Kahneman and Tversky did the work on this. They wrote a book called Thinking Fast and Slow about how humans are not rational in many, many ways, and there's endless. It's a wonderful book. Most of the chapters are just eight to 12 pages, well-written, funny examples of all the illogical things that we do, right? I mean, I will drive across town to save uh, four cents a gallon on gas, <coughs> which, you know, with a 20-gallon tank, that's 80 cents. But if I'm in Walmart and the TV there is $20 more expensive than it is across town, I don't go across town. So we do lots and lots of illogical things. But it makes for easy uh, <laughs> prediction, but not necessarily accurate prediction of what human beings do. But, you know, it's kind of like the old joke of the... Uh, drunk who loses his car keys and somebody comes along and says, oh, let me help you find him. Uh, searching here underneath the light. Uh, where did you last see him? Over there. But the light's way better here, right? So that got a laugh from my students the other day. I know it's late. So like I said, Kahneman. Um, again, incorrect implications, going back to that computer model of mine. Neurons are not digital. You know, we say they fire zero or one. But they are not digital in the way a computer is digital. They don't fire and stay flipped. They're not set to a zero and a one. Um, thought is not disembodied and rational like a computer, nor is it emotionless. And this metaphor, this is the whole thing, it's a rationalist dream, is incredibly powerful. I never teach intro without going here. In cognitive, I teach this for three weeks or more. There's so much here, it's unbelievable. And it's so flawed. It, it has so much to offer, so many benefits, and so many flaws at the same time. So kind of like that electricity through a wire thing, we've got to identify, we should try to identify where it works and where it doesn't work. It's important to do that. And it's funny, I was criticizing this in class the other day, and I swear, two sentences later, I used it in a different way. And the metaphor was out of my mouth before I even realized it. But at least it was a proper usage. Okay. 
again, you know, the idea of conscious AI, I, I, I don't buy it, right? And I could totally be wrong. <laughs> don't bet any money on my prediction. Uh, another great one in psychology is the homunculus. There's a word for you. <clears throat> it means the little person inside your head. And biology has the homunculus too, right? How do you get a duck out of a duck egg? Well, there's a little tiny, little tiny adult duck in there that just needs to grow. That's the homunculus theory in biology. But what does it do for us in psychology? Well, how does vision work? You know, you get this input and all of you appear on a screen in my head so that the homunculus can watch it. Okay, great. But there is no screen. This, this that I'm seeing and what you're seeing never appears assembled in a unified representation anywhere in your brain. Never. And there's no one in there to watch it, right? Because if there was, who's inside his or her head watching it? Free will. We're conflicted. I want to eat the chocolate because it tastes good. I want to climb. I want to lose weight. I don't want to eat the chocolate. What should I do? The homunculus decides I've got free will, right? Really? Self, I'm conflicted. Which, which of me wants the chocolate and which one of me doesn't want the chocolate? The answer is there is no me. There's no homunculus. Yourself is, what is whatever is activated at any given time. So there's the self that wants the chocolate and there's the self that doesn't want the chocolate and you flip back and forth, right? I don't believe in a self. But, you know, if you're religious, then you can identify that with a soul and it's really easy. Um, but as I alluded to, does everybody know this metaphor, this joke? The guy goes, climbs the mountain to talk to the guru and says, I'm wondering what holds up the world so it doesn't fall out of the air. It rides on the back of a turtle. Oh, thank you. So he goes down and the monk thinks about it and he's like, wait a second. Climbs the mountain the next day, asks the guru, well, what's this turtle supported by? Another turtle. Oh, okay. Does that again the third day. What's that turtle on? Another turtle. Come on. And the monk says, yeah, it's turtles all the way down. Right? So we have these recursive, impossible explanations. The homunculus can't be the explanation because there's got to be a homunculus in his head and his head and her head and her head, etc. So it's a nonsensical explanation. Um, I am very pro-math and pro-science, absolutely, 100%, even if it'll never get us to capital T truth. Um, and some of the pros, like I said, is better understanding. And sometimes, oh my gosh, it's 7.12? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, insight, look at all these uh, um, metaphors. Insight, aha, sparks, flash, light bulb moments. And, you know, a lot of these things came, calculator, right? The benzene ring, got that one right. You know, there's this flash of inspiration. Sometimes people are dreaming, daydreaming, brushing their teeth, and all of a sudden, boom, I've got an idea, and it pans out. Um, should I quit? Let's, let's look at math for a second. Surely math can't be metaphorical, right? It's totally rational. It's all logic. There's only one right answer, or a set of solutions, plus four and minus four solves the equation. But math is merely a toolkit. It's a bunch of models. So answer this one. You don't have to answer out loud. I don't want to embarrass anybody. Given a line and a point, not on that line. How many parallel lines exist through that point? There's the point, there's the line. The interior angles of a triangle sum to Euclidean geometry, parallel lines one, the degrees, 180 degrees in a triangle. But there are other metaphors. Spherical geometry. If I'm doing geometry on the surface of the Earth, there are zero parallel lines because a line is defined as something that bisects the sphere like a lines of longitude, they all intersect at the poles. There are no parallel lines in spherical geometries, and the interior angles are greater than 180. Hyperbolic geometry, parallel lines, minimum of two, maybe infinite. The interior angles are less than 180, and it wasn't this particular hyperbolic geometry, but Riemannian geometry is how Einstein was able to formulate the equations of general relativity. Einstein was no Einstein, I'm just joking. He did not know how to do what he was trying to do, and somebody else, another mathematician who was familiar with the right tool for the job, I mean, just like a carpenter, said, hey, this might do what you're talking about. Check this out. So he taught himself Ramanian geometry, and he solved general relativity. He needed the right metaphor. So metaphors can be wonderful. But, you know, which is reality? We have three different views of reality here, and it depends. The tool has to fit the job. Descartes, and all of us think we live in a three-dimensional world that you know, works by Cartesian coordinates. But 
Einstein showed, no, we're wrong. You know, for what we can perceive, that works. But in reality, this is closer to the universe, we hope. <laughs> and will that last? I don't know. Um, so what can we say about reality? I'm a physicalist. I believe physical reality exists. I'm a deep skeptic, but, you know, I draw the line somewhere. But I don't think we can ever know it objectively, and there will be a lot more on that next week based on evolution. There is no mind-independent knowledge, just like there's no color without a brain. There's no sound without a brain. There's no knowledge without a brain. So we can never get our brains to fully understand the universe in a mind-independent way. That's what we strive for. That's what, you know, if I throw away the subjectivity of being a human being, what is really out there? And that's inaccessible to us. Again, there are multiple truths about color and gravity, right? Gravity goes away with general relativity. They still talk about it, but it's not a force. It's just warped space-time. So stuff falls down into the uh, depth. Uh, knowledge truth depends on our perspective, uh, as I said. And uh, this would be a good place to stop there. Well, let me just give you a couple. Blue states versus red states, left wing versus right wing. Uh, make America great again. That was really original of Trump after Spain, Poland, Indonesia, Sweden had already said that years and decades in the past. Social safety nets? What a, what a metaphor, right? Yeah, let me catch you when you lose your job. Safety net. Or we can counter that with the dreaded nanny state. You know, these are metaphors that shape our emotions and our beliefs and the way we vote. Uncle Sam, founding fathers, sending sons into war. You know, what's this metaphor all about? Family. The nation is like a family. The government is like your parents, and citizens are the children. And uh, unless you really want me to go on, uh, this is a very long extended metaphor that kind of explains conservative versus liberal orientations uh, from Lakoff. It's very powerful, but it's fairly controversial, and it's three slides long. So um, I'm happy to talk about it. But man, you guys have been here for a long time. <laughs> any, uh, if, if you beg me to, I'll talk about it. But any questions or anything? Comments? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, I hope you had even a quarter as much fun as I had, and it was a good night for you. And if not, I'm sorry. I know some of you are here for extra credit. Yeah. That's, that's a good question. Why do we jump in the shower? Yeah. Are you in line or online? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, in, in line makes sense. You know, the line is a thing. It's a somewhat bounded region. Uh, online? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Are you supported by the Internet or something like that? <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's one I don't say. Well, you know, I mean, we, we, language changes over time. And, uh, you know, some people would disagree with me about certain things. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I literally died is literally wrong, <laughs> right? Um, but we get away with it. And people will say based off of. I mean, that's becoming very, very common, even though you're violating the metaphor. Um, you know, and... And, and a lot of times we don't know the metaphor, so it doesn't matter. There's a, uh, well, there's dead metaphors, like beyond the pale. What does beyond the pale mean? It's like the lights are on or the lights open. Yeah, yeah, there's a good one. Yeah, there's a good one. But what you're, you're opening or closing the circuit, so that one makes sense to me. I can see both uh, working. Um, but beyond the pale is something that's unacceptable, right? And some people know that meaning, but they don't know where it comes from. It comes from that horrible, the wilds of Ireland. People in England were like, man, once you go beyond the border, the border was the pale. You're beyond the pale. Look out. You know, you're in wild country now. No laws apply. Um, so metaphors can just basically become synonyms, a dead metaphor. And then we have metonyms where um, the word just is substituted for something else, like Kleenex, you know. I don't know that the Kleenex are up here, Kleenex brand, I'm pretty sure they're not. But if I say Kleenex, you know what I mean, that's a metonym. So, yeah, language does evolve, and, and so some of our metaphors no longer make sense, or the, our usage of the metaphors, we've lost, you know, the meaning. And again, they're implicit. Very few of us use these metaphors and say, oh, I know where they came from, I know exactly what they mean. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Get overused or used in this place, but not that place. 
Yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's super interesting. People living in different parts of the world have different experiences, and people from different backgrounds have different experiences. So, yeah, that are going to uh, drive their metaphors in different directions. Um, just like my example of uh, we arrange things left to right, time flows left to right, you know, stock market, uh, you know, doing math, uh, physicists agree, things, the arrow of time moves left to right, arrow of time, there's a nice metaphor. Um, but then other people in other cultures will arrange things east to west. So, you know, they're not completely arbitrary. In both cases, they're tied to some experience. Uh, left to right, um, one explanation for that is that most people are right-handed, and if you're writing with something that smudges, it makes more sense to write left to right so you're not smudging as you write. And in some cultures uh, that don't worry about smudging, they write top-down, uh, that takes care of the smudging, but some they write right to left if the implements that they were using way back when uh, didn't smudge. I don't know if that's 100% accurate, but most people are right-handed. <laughs> yep. Anything else? You're all just like dazed. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry I didn't get to religion. I, I mean, I really wanted to talk about that one. I'm half joking, right? We're never supposed to talk about politics and religion. We'll upset people, but we're all open-minded. We're all academic type people, right? We're all out here for an education, so it's good to be challenged. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. <clears throat>